Yeah. Uh, uh, especially today, I think uh, we have a small group that we could uh, feel free to discuss, to exchange ideas. You know, I stand in this library, I think uh, one I need really thank the, uh, Professor Jerry Murray. Is, uh, he invited me. Second, uh, I think uh, my former boss, Dean Caesar Caballero. 2004, I was come to Pennsylvania to Los Angeles. I was hired by this man. <laughs> so it's not only it's not only this is a boss and a faculty member. During my stay in California State University Los Angeles Library, I get 100% my research get 100% from the boss. You know. So today, really short. Sure thank you, Caesar. So also. Uh, this, although this is not my library, but this is a part of a chain library. As a librarian, could present our research yeah, results. So when we talk about China's cultural revolution, actually it's really a tragedy. It's not a happy thing. So that's why I guess so the machine don't want to work. So delay, delay, <laughs> right? It's really not a, not a uh, fan. It's not a really a fan. So the Cultural Revolution in China leads to 10 years. Here is uh, my you know, conclusion about what is the Cultural Revolution. First is a starting type, great future. Second is not the Cultural Revolution. Actually, it's anti-culture and anti-civilization. The last one. It's a Chinese Holocaust. Actually, it's much worse than Holocaust. So I will use Guangxi, those secret documents, as an example. First, I think I give you the order view. You understand what is the cultural revolution in general. Then we go to one particular province. So the cultural revolution basically you know, if we look at the power struggle perspective, is it between those two men? One is Chiang Meng Mao. Chiang Meng Mao was the founder of Red China. It's a founder of a uh, uh, no, lot of things made in China. So that's because the Red China was founded by Chiang Meng Mao. Another is a second chairman called Chiang Meng Liu. Chiang Meng Liu is the president of People's Republic of China. They actually is a comrade in arm. But if you look at the history of the communist movement, you will find revolution within the revolution, within the revolution, never end. Actually, the revolution, the bigger feature of revolution, it's the one camp of people then divide into two factions. Then they fatten each other. Very important thing, people divide, people fatten each other. It's human nature. Just like this country, you know, you have a republic, you have Democrats. But the method for their fighting each other is totally different. For a democratic society, you know, Trump, you could get your chance maybe two years, maybe four years. But, you know, another guy could be up. But in Communist Party, there it's life to the death. Life to death. It's not a, I could retire, I could go back again. If you win, you stay on your position. If you lost, you were persecuted to the death because you are class enemy. So basically, what Mao want to do, launch the Cultural Revolution, is to try to turn the group dictatorship to his one-person dictatorship. What is a group dictatorship? Let's say Communist Party have a central committee, then have a political bureau. They usually have nine person or 13 person. So this should be highest group. They lead the whole country, they lead the whole party. But Mao is not satisfied. Mao thought he should become a revolutionary god. 
other A person and him should just follow him. So before the Cultural Revolution, he first, you know, what to do is launch a great campaign for the personal code. That means, you know, uh, China's uh, revolutionary god is only one person, it's Chairman Mao. So there is not a law, not a space for two chairmen. So they have to fight each other. The result is Liu was persecuted in November 12, 1969. Actually, he already put it in jail. After three years, he first became crazy, then died because he is something like mid-70 years old. OK. So even though Liu died, Mao, as a great dictator, still have fear. All the dictators have fear. Because he thought, you know, Liu had his fellows. A lot of cadres, they may not be loyal to, to him. So the purge is extended from the top to the low level cadres. So what kind of things to do during the Cultural Revolution when I was 16 years old, when Cultural Revolution launched in 1966? So a lot of you know, uh, top cadres, middle link officers was struggled by math. According to the mouse instruction, it's a, this is the test for you. You are real loyal to me or not? You know, if you are real loyal to me, you maybe get released by Mao. You maybe go back to your post. If not, the fate is just like you. So a lot of uh, cadres, government officers, by the mouse. Okay, so. We could compare with Stalin's Great Puget and Mao's Cultural Revolution. All those are power struggles. But my view, the Cultural Revolution is much worse than Stalin's Great Puget. So if we talk about the duration, you know, basically Stalin's Great Puget is three to four years. But the Cultural Revolution least 10 years. If you talk about the target scope, basically Stalin's great future focus is on the party officers. It's inside the party. For instance, here it's uh, uh, you know, uh, the statistics. Member of the Central Party Committee persecuted in Stalin's great future is 64. But in Mao's Cultural revolution is a 72. The worst thing is, you know, the Mao's cultural revolution is extended to ordinary Chinese people. Basically, Stalin's great puja, yes, the great puja is touched ordinary people, but basically is inside the party. So here you could see, here you could see. There is a big difference. The total member of political persecution actually is a 1,000% difference, 1,000% difference. The only one thing Stalin's great pleasure to do is starting to do things simple. Arrest you, torture you, then kill you. But Mao do things more complex. If we say the Stalin's Style is a legal or police, state police, you know, use this force that Mao used so called mass dictatorship. So you should know everything the organized violence and the unorganized violence. Which one is worse? Actually, the mass dictatorship, mass violence, always worse, always more brutal. Over brutal. The last one, total and nature the day's death. Stalin's, I think it's based upon the research, about a one million. But for a cultural revolution, it's about a two to three million. So which one is worse? In my view, I think it's the cultural revolution, 
it's worth. The second thing we talk about anti-culture and anti-civilization catastrophe. This is the picture. It's on Beijing's street in the summer of 1966. See the young students, you know, they just burn the old books, paintings, some art stuff. Why? They thought they only need mouse instruction. Just like North Korea, you know, you could see the North Korea. So when we the historian study on cultural revolution and study on modern Chinese history, we always say one thing: it's the first Korea War. Now we thought the American military did one great thing: is use their bomb, kill mouse only son. Mouse have two sons. One have mental problem. The other ones, Mao sent him to First Korea War, but he did not expect the American bomber, you know, killed his son. That make Mao don't have nature successor. So we always joking say this is the only and the great victory for American military <laughs> because. They killed the mouse son. Otherwise, could it be China could be like North Korea. If China still like North Korea, the world will be in bigger trouble because this is a bigger country, have uh, nuclear arsenals. So so far, China still have trouble, but at least it's not a mouse style. So you could see how crazy. According to a non-government investigation, only Beijing. One city, how many books was born? It's about five million books was born. Was born. So, also you could see anti-civilization related to religion. In Beijing, in 1966, only Catholic church in Beijing have a couple of Catholic nuns. They actually live in China since their childhood, but in the summer of 1966, they was announced by students, by those red guards, say they are spy. Because at that time, anyone following the, you are spy. So there was a, you know, a spy aging the Chinese government expelled there to Italy. Actually, they from childhood stay in, in, in China. So, I give you some numbers. You could see how damaged the civilization. Here is the religion set in China, 1949 to 1976. So before 1949, that means before China or Communist Party occupied China, there is something 116,000 religion set, include the church, include the temple. Everything. Then, before 1966, Communist Party occupied China already 17 years, it's reduced to 25%. Then, during the Cultural Revolution, it's only 3,000. How many percent? 2.5%. So you could see the civilization was damaged gradually, rapidly, during the Cultural Revolution. The last one, Chinese Holocaust, humanitarian disaster in human history. This statistic is from government secret document. So you could see how many people, how many people we call the abnormal death to. What means abnormal? That means you were struggled by mass dictatorship, you were arrested, you were killed, then they will say all of those is abnormal, even include suicide, commit suicide. So here is about three million, about three million. This is not I, you know, fake up the those numbers. Those numbers is come from government statistics. So there is other laws about the Cultural Revolution. First is economy. 
total lost, according to government statistics, about a 500 billion American dollars. You know, that time, China's GDP is very low. It's not like today, not like today. Maybe 300 billion is nothing. The time, 300 billion means China's almost 30 years profits of their GDP, of their GDP. Also, the education, the 10-year period, the high school, elementary school, university, almost closed. Only in later years, they open a little bit, they hide, they allow some students to get in. All those students, about a certain percentage, I will guess 40 to 50 percent, is thrown back door because their parents is the high-ranking officers, just like China's president Xi. That time, she got into the university. But those university students, they don't need any test. Actually, their knowledge level, their intelligence level, it's very low. It's very low. So you talk about the culture and the ethics. I think at least three to four generations will have very bad impact. You cannot imagine, you know, American society, all the university from Harvard to CSUSB all close to for 10 years who were educated people. So you could guess, you could you know, confidently say in paired in three to four generations. Okay, why cultural revolution occurred in China? I don't want to very detail, but give you some reasons because related to the Guangxi incident. First is the system problem. You know, cultural revolution cannot be happen to be in the United States because it's a totally different system. But from communist system, it's a dictatorship system happen. Second thing, very important, is the leadership. You know, the leader Mao is not only great dictator, but also a great utopian and a populist. Now, he always used the and the name of people. When my days, you know, I was 16 when Cultural Revolution, I also participated in the Cultural Revolution very actively because at the time we all believe Mao. 100% think Mao will lead us go to the heaven. Actually, go, went to here. Actually, went to here. So Mao always used the term, it's people. I think somehow I heard someone say that in Washington, it's the term, it's people. So we from people, we service for people, we are the people, we are the people. I represent the people. So Mao want to launch the cultural revolution to against what? To against the bureaucrats in Beijing. Actually, he is the top bureaucrat, huh? but he wants to against the bureaucrats. He wants to against the bureaucrats class, bureaucrat class. So he will establish what kind of society? The society is, you know, no bad people. Everybody is happy. Everybody is equal. So this kind of utopia idea, especially you know, for a young person, students 16 years old like me, think, wow, this is so wonderful. Then Mao give you a doctrine, say, if we want to get the heaven, we need suffer. We need to use some variance. So at the time, we all thought the future is blind. The only one thing, you know, the temporary current it's not good. So we, that's why we still bring Mao. So the, the Mao, during the cultural revolution, why the cultural revolution lasts very longer? Also, cultural revolution actually is uh, attack each class status, from government officers, from military, from the ordinary people. 
because Mao actually is an opportunist. He changed his idea, changed the revolutionary target. In 1966, he indicated the target is very clear, it's bureaucrats inside the government, inside the party. But in 1968, he changed. He said, that, well, this revolution actually is a communist party against the Kuomintang. Kuomintang is a, now in Taiwan, is another party. So actually, he led the mass dictatorship go to the ordinary people. Those people have some link to the you know, Kuomintang party, nationalist, nationalist. So the third one is Mao have uh, ambition. He wants to be a leader for international communist movement. So this were very much related. We talk about the Guangxi incident. Guangxi, here is some general information about Guangxi. Guangxi certainly is one of China's 29 province. Also, the population is about 25 million. Very important thing here is you know, very important thing, it's uh, Guangxi shared the border with Vietnam. When Mao launched the Cultural Revolution, actually it's a Vietnam War, Vietnam War. America and the Vietnam Communist Party fighting each other. So based upon Mao's theory, Guangxi is a front line as well as the, the baseline for Vietnam War. So a lot of money, a lot of weapons, even the troops Mao sent to Vietnam is from Guangxi. That means in Guangxi, almost we call it something like the, you know, the semi-war zone, semi-war zone. So generals and army officers, militias, though they lead the revolutionary committee during the Cultural Revolution. So that's the basic thing for we to understand the Guangxi you know, incident. This is the general, General Wei Guoqing. He was the one you know, launched large massacre, but he had very special relationship with the Vietnamese Communist Party leader, Hu Ziming, Hu Ziming the founder of communist Vietnam. This is Mao Zedong. When Hu Ziming led the Vietnamese Communist Party to occupy Vietnam, actually Chinese, the Chairman Mao, sent the Wei Guoqing and his troop went to Vietnam to help them fighting, first with the French, then with America. He served as the head of military council to Hu Ziming. To Hu Ziming. So they have very special relationship. So that make one dilemma. The first is the Cultural Revolution. Mao want to examine each provincial leader, like Guangxi, the leader, General Wei Guoqing. So Mao first launched mass to against Wei Guoqing. Then Hu Ziming get involved According to the secret document, Hu Ziming sent a message to Mao, say, if you don't want to, you don't want to general way, Vietnam welcome him. So this will give Mao a you know, choice. Or you choose, you launch the force, you launch the mass movement, the people, or you choose general way. Because Mao want to be a leader of the Communist Party. So in 1968, Mao abandoned the mass organization. He established. For general way, certainly this is a chance. I you know, control the armed militia. I control the arm. You know, I certainly want to retaliate. So that's the reason. Guangxi is the number one province for the abnormal deaths, for the abnormal, for so many horrible things. Directly, 
stood by the conducted by army, conducted by the armed militia. Armed militia. So let's see what happened. See, this is the 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 uh, publication, the ebook series I just published the last year. So this is the original secret archive published in 1987. We find that we collect all those, then we publish. About 13,000 pages. It's 18 parts. You know, those are after the Cultural Revolution, the CCP Central Committee sent a working group. They spent 10 years to investigate Guangxi Cultural Revolution. So many incidents, then they load those reports. We, we find those, we finally publish that because we want to people know the historical truth. Here is some comments from you know, the New York Review of the book, from Global and the Mayor, even New York Times interview me about because most complete secret document about 7 million, 7.5 million characters, 36 volumes for uh, one province published overseas. This is the first time. Because it's very difficult to, to get those secret documents. So historical truth, we should say, large partially you know, exposed, exposed. Very important thing, we will notice that I will repeat, see, there is no clear boundary between human beings and animal. Because you think, why I talk about uh, this one, you will see. OK. The Guangxi, the, there is three features. One, we read those uh, secret documents. The first feature is I uh, covered the number one massacre in China's Cultural Revolution. As we say, it's about 2 million people was killed or committed suicide during the Cultural Revolution. Guangxi is number one. According to the secret document, fully identify it's 89,700. What means the fully identify? Fully identify means this person killed. His body is here, his name is here, his address all match. That means fully identified. Partially identified, 30,000. Partially 35 means we know this person dead, but we cannot find this person's dead body. Because a lot of time the army killed the opposition, opposite the mass. They just threw their bodies to the river. Then the river go to the sea, the river, then the, those cobras go to Hong Kong. If you read the Hong Kong newspaper, read the New York Times at this time, and uh, during the Cultural Revolution, they report a lot of you know, dead bodies found by the sea. Missing, 20,000. You know, during the Cultural Revolution in China, everybody have their food coupon. If you want to purchase a pizza, you need to show you know, the sales lady a coupon. If you don't have the food steps, you cannot get pizza even though you have money. So this is a fully controlled communist society. What means the missing? The missing means dead. Just you cannot find their body, cannot find their information. So the official total is 140,000. After the Cultural Revolution, number of reporters, journalists, they to do the non-government investigation. Their conclusion is at least 200,000 people were killed. So this is number one. If you count the whole China is 2 million, Guangxi could be 10%. But China have 29 provinces. So this is one thing. We talk about a massacre. The nature and the time of the massacre. Basically, it's focused one year. It's 1968. 
I read the conclusion for you. This conclusion is from the secret document. The secret document who combined them is by the Central Committee. So they say that among the overload deaths to only 3,312 people died the infection of arms struggle because of two mass organizations that are fighting each other. From the statistics above, one can clearly see the evidence. One, massacre was organized and planned by level of authorities. The second one is the killing all occurred and the peaceful situation. That means the killing is the army, the armed militia, kill the person, kill the people without any unarmed, unarmed. So this is why is 1968? Because 1968, Mao changed the major target of the Cultural Revolution. Then the Revolutionary Committee, from provisional level, from county level, all established. When we talk about a Cultural Revolution, people always have a misunderstanding. People always think, oh, that's because of energy period. Because 1966 to 1967, the two opposition mass, they fighting each other. Actually, fighting each other, how many people died? Only 3,000. Then we see how many people died, about 200,000. So they all killed by authority. That means the, by army, by the armed militia, by the revolutionary committee, each level, each level. The second thing we talk about, which, who is the victim? Who is the victim? Victim basically is a class enemy, so-called black five categories. For instance, the landlord, the rich peasants, counter-revolutionaries, bad elements, and the rightists. The rightists basically is intellectuals. It's a school teachers, university professors, and the landlord, the rich parents. It's the Communist Party, they create the enemy. The landlord and the rich parents actually, it's you know, the middle class in countryside. They actually, it's much poorer than the American former. Now, sometimes I visit Central California, I see one farmer, one peasant have how many acres of land? Actually, in China, because the population is so big, the land is limited. I think if you have two this kind of square feet, the land, you will be the rich peasant. Then you will be the class enemy. You will be killed by the army, by the armed militia. So based upon the secret document is a 56%, 56%. It's a so-called those class enemy. So we call this a class signed and poorly signed genocide, right? This, uh, so other group, I say the school teacher, doctors, and the intellectuals, the third one is opposition mass. As I said, you know, during the Cultural Revolution, in the beginning, Mao launched, Mao inspired those mass to against the general way. Then in 1968, Mao supported the general way. So Mao is an opportunist. Everything for, for him, for, you know, kind of consolidated his power he will do. He don't care other. So then, general way to do the revenge, to do the revenge. So the opposition uh, mass. The decision make, organizer, and the killers. Certainly, general way and the other leaders of Guangxi Provisional Revolutionary uh, Committee. Army officer and the local government leader is organizer. The killers, it's armed militia, all the soldiers. After the Cultural Revolution, there is a statistics. How many people get involved in the CCP party, Chinese Communist Party member, or the Malaysia member? 
in Guangxi is 56,000 people, they are killers. 56,000, they are killers. How many people get involved in, I will go to that position, uh, that point, eaten other people? So, cannibalism, cannibalism. About two to three thousand, you just cannot imagine. So, first, the mass killing is directed by use regular army. It's only for established revolutionary authority. When I talk about the Black Five category, those people, it's not the, from Cultural Revolution label them as a class enemy. It's from beginning of the Red China. It's from 1950. They were confiscated by the, the Communist Party, by their land, you know, labeled them as class enemy. Basically, before the Cultural Revolution, during the Cultural Revolution, they did not participate in any political activity. Also, they are not allowed participate in political activity. But why still will kill them? Because we establish revolutionary authority. Only for that purpose. Only for that purpose. Also, some slaughter of POWs. You know, here is a capital of the Guangxi province. This is a department store. Department store. During the army director attack this department store because this department store gather opposition mass. The opposition mass thought they stay in that department store, then they will be safe. Actually not. Army used tank with cannon. See, this department store is actually totally destroyed. Totally destroyed. How many POW was killed? Here is a number. Here is a number. It's 2,324 of 96. 24.2% were killed. You already surrounded, but they still kill you. What they do, the worst thing is they always cook up charges. Here I give you one example. There is a Burma county. You know, when army get into the county, want to surprise, want to kill the opposition mass, the opposition must withdraw, go to the mountain, go to the mountain. Then, you know, go to the mountain is very difficult for, for army to do, especially at the time Chinese army don't have the mother of the bomb. We just drop it in, in uh, Afghanistan, right? So that time, what they do is they just send some spy aging, go to the mountain to contact those uh, mass, the peoples live there. They say, we come from Taiwan. We send two aircraft. If you go with us, go to somewhere, we will carry you to Taiwan. You know, for those people that withdraw from mountain, they only hope is they could survive. So they just follow those uh, army secret agents, uh, go to a station point. Actually, army already surrounded there. Then as soon as they get there, army use machine gun, use cannon to eliminate them. Those kind of person, couple of thousand. So you could see the army want to kill those opposition people. You know, they use any worst method. They use any worst method. OK, killing victim. Actually, it's only by phone, by phone. It's, there is, you know, 200 kind of tortures, 200. I list a couple of, I list a couple of. Let me give you one story, because I really don't want to repeat the 200, you know, the, the, the tortures. One school principal, he was tortured by I'm the militia, and by his students. But he don't want to acknowledge or say, well, I was uh, you know, aging the sand uh, from Taiwan. So he not compromised. 
Then they just torture him night by day. In the end, in the end, he still resists. They send his mother to talk with him. You know what his mother brought to him? His mother brought a very strong poison to him. His mother said to him, say, I don't want to, I don't have the courage to see you tortured by those people. The best way for me to help you is you just eat the poison. Then you could die immediately. You could finish your pain. This is a real story. See, a loving mother brought a poison to, a, to his son, to the school principal, one to his loving son to die immediately. So you could imagine those kind of torture, those kind of torture, how ruthless, how brutal. The last one is that they always force son to kill father. Then they kill son. They beheaded the husband's head. Then they force wife to carry his or her husband's head went through the town, went through the town. But those are not the worst nightmare yet. So during the Cultural Revolution, there is two provinces occurred cannibalism. One is Yunnan. Also, Yunnan is a massacre, you know, uh, uh, Occurred. Second is Guangxi. Guangxi is a weaver of shocking cannibalism across the whole province. If you read the whole, you know, seven million characters, the secret document, you count there is 302 victims. But according to non government, non government investigation, Conducted by a group of journalists. Actually, the, the, terror, the, the total number is 421, 421. You may say the 421 is a not a big number, but let me give you a comparison. You could understand this is a shocking number. You know, during 1959 to 1962, China has a great famine. Great famine. Of course, the famine is a man-made famine by Mao's policy. The total Guangxi province, how many people, you know, starve to death? Half a million. But only have five to ten victims. They were eaten by other people. Also, those five to ten victims was died first. Then the people feel starving, then eat their dead body. The organizer and the perpetrator. So it's army officers, the leader of local militia department, militia members, most of it's the party members. There is one county called Wuxuan County. The Wuxuan County, the calibre occurred, it's number one in all the province, uh, the counties. There is a name, the people's name, the perpetrator's name, 130 perpetrators. They conduct the cannibalism. 91, that means 84% are party members and the government officers. Victims, same as massacre, but the two features, one, their age is young. Second, it's a they were intellectuals. For instance, in Wuxuan County, teachers and the principals in two high school was eaten, beat to death, and eaten by those students. Because the students want to show they are revolutionary. They thought that the teacher and their principal is a class enemy. If they kill them, and they, they eat them, they become a revolutionaries. So 
you cannot imagine today, but it's in reality during the Cultural Revolution, real happened. How did motivation? First, as I said, identify the nature of revolutionary based upon the class struggle theory. Because the communist theory is uh, we want to eliminate those class enemy. Then we could uh, go to the communist heaven. The violence is necessary. Violence is temporary. The heaven is forever. Actually, the violence is forever. The heaven is never come. Never come. So, the second thing is some evil belief. The young victim's heart and liver can help for the longevity or health. The third one is a personal resentment. So the time, during the time, that those kind of cannibalism happen, a lot of leaders, they just use those militia to kill the people who against them. Because the whole social order is damaged. They easy to manipulate, easy to manipulate. See, this is very horrible during the uh, Cultural Revolution in Guangxi. The third feature of Guangxi Cultural Revolution, you know, inside the secret document where tell us is the most notorious sex crime as a result or as a you know, side effect of the massacre. So total about 25 case inside those secret archive, about 1,000 female victim of rape, of gang rape, all those kind of things. Victims, it's daughters, and the daughter-in-law of the Black Five family, who were forced to remarry those unmarried male you know, perpetrators. One condition is after their children, after their husband were killed. Of course, female POW. Usually they killed after gang rape. The third one is the and the age of the girl, after slaughter their whole family and rape her, he she usually were killed too. In one case, in one case, a group of Malaysia killed one 15 years old girls, two brothers, one father, one mother, then rape her, even kill her, even eat her, eat her liver and heart. So those are totally horrible stories, but happened very popular during the massacre. Now, here is the you know, perpetrate, perpetrate. Basically, after the Cultural Revolution, the government re-examined the case. They put 10 persons in death sentence, only 10 persons, as I said, 56,000 Communist Party members get involved in killing. Only put a death sentence for 10 person. Five of 10 is a rapist, it's a rapist. They not only rape the girls, rape the female, but also kill them, but also kill them. Okay, we talk about the reason why this kind of, you know, ruthless, you know, happen, massacre, cannibalism, sick crime in Guangxi's uh, cultural revolution. First, we should say the state sponsorship. Certainly, Mao and the, the CCP provincial leaders, the high-ranking leaders, they were not to do their self. They were not, you know, ask people to do this kind of uh, extreme crime but they create the guidance. They create their long-standing national policy. The long-standing national policy is life to the death class struggle theory, class struggle theory. So 
this one is a state sponsored. Other evidence is all the perpetrators, organizers, they have their identity as a government officer, army officer, and the head of the militia, as well as the militia members. Those should be a part of a state machine. Basically, the state machine, just like a police department, army, or national guard, they should keep, they should maintain the social order. But during the Cultural Revolution in Guangxi, those state machine, part of state machine, they launch, they overturn the social order. So you could imagine in Los Angeles, one day all the policemen, they go to downtown store, they burn those store, they rap the bank. What kind of impact? The society will be very soon go to the chaos. The people will be followed. People will be followed. So the second thing is the government actually allow that. Allow that. They, you know, close the air, let those militia, let those army to do those bad things. Now, there is 1984 when CCP's Central Committee wants to do the, you know, investigation. Then they established the one policy, say any party member during the Cultural Revolution, if they eaten people, if they conduct calibrist actions, they should be get out from the party. You know what the General Wei said, General Wei Guqing said, General Wei Guqing said, why calibrist cannot be a party member? All party constitution did not indicate it. So he think people eaten another human beings, it's nothing, it's nothing. Could it be a party elite, could it be a party member. The last one is the evil traits. How those evil traits were inspired by those, you know, evidence, those incidents. First is you could see the Communist Party basic force, army officer, militia, those people, they are really bad people. They are not good people. Second thing is sometimes killing all victim family member just because you know their sexual or property desire. Because you kill all the family members, you could rap, you could confiscate their property. Also, you could confiscate those young females, right? That, you know, the, actually the Cultural Revolution is inspired the evil traits of ordinary people. If you say ordinary people, you know, those armed militias, they're also ordinary people. Why they could be, become this kind of, become an animal, Here's my conclusion, that there is no clear boundary between human beings and the animals. If you subvert the normal social order, people could be very easily close that boundary from human being to animals. We don't see this kind of thing here, largely, because the social order not turned down. We still have the social order. During the Cultural Revolution, so-called the revolution, inspired everybody have evil trait inside us, but was inspired by the revolution. So became a hair. The whole Guangxi in 1968 became a, a hair. Okay, I think from a general, you know, the frame about the Cultural Revolution, about a particular one province experience, we could see what the Cultural Revolution is, what the Communist Party is, what the Communist Party revolution is, but the revolution is not finished yet, not finished yet. See, 
This is a chamber mouth. This is a. Sorry, uh, the the last one. Uh, last one. One is a chamber mouth. Another is a chamber she. Chamber she. Now, just have talk with uh, President Trump <laughs> in the Florida, right? Chairman Xi. See, this is a Time Magazine. Time Magazine examined Chairman Xi's policy. Actually, Chairman Xi is very much like uh, go back to Mao's period. As I said, why? Because before Chairman Xi have this certain attempt, there is a group dictatorship. Is a political bureau, nine person, they group dictatorship. Chairman Xi very much admired Chairman Mao because he, she thought should be one person become a revolutionary guard, revolutionary number one. Other eight persons is under him. So three years ago, he got the power, he did a lot of things. Other things, try to establish Chairman Mao like a position for himself. So you could see China, a lot of things, uh, human rights you now get decreased, a lot of uh, you know, human rights lawyers was arrested, you know, intellectuals uh, and a uh, couple of uh, you know, uh, newspapers, uh, they want tell the truth was closed by the government. All those, uh, it's uh, Chairman Xi tried to establish himself like Chairman Bao by using the personnel code. So in China, the revolution is not finished yet. As long as the Communist Party still in that ruler position. Thank you very much for your lesson. Thank you. Any question? Yeah, since we have some more priests. So the documents that you recovered mm. were written by the Communist Party operatives at the time, right? Yes. Since I may be overstepped, since the government generally doesn't write the truth, mm. they they want to you know write what supports what they what wants to be seen. Yeah, right. Do you think they would have either inflated the numbers, like mm. more people were killed than mm. were killed, or do yeah. you think they would be incentivized to say less people died mm. than actually mm. died? And, okay. and why do you think it would be either one of those? Okay, okay. Uh, in China, the political movement to do this way, you know, always motivated by the party members' power struggle. Mm -hmm. You know, after the Cultural Revolution, you know, Deng Xiaoping got in number one, mm -hmm. right? Deng Xiaoping getting number one, he had to find some base, could establish he is right during the Cultural Revolution. Mao is wrong. But he don't want 100% through Mao away. Because he 100% through Mao away, that means he cannot be the dictator, right? Because the system is a dictator system. But he still want to something. You know, to show the people, to show especially the inside of the party, the rivers. So that's why the reformers in the party, especially Hu Yaobang and Zhao Ziyang, I think I'm not sure you're familiar with that. Zhao Ziyang is a general secretary during the 1989 students' movement. He resisted Deng Xiaoping. Don't want to send an army to surprise uh, students. Hu Yaobang early treated as a liberalist. So they use the opportunity of the party power struggle. They send the you know, so-called work team to Guangxi. Also mobilize 100,000 local cadres working for four years, got this secret document. So basically for the motivation of the people after the Cultural Revolution, when the Communist Party say, oh, Mao made a mis big mistake. So people say, you made a mistake, then you, you want to repair us. So my father was killed, you should 
we call the rehabilitation right, movement. But the motivation is not from people, it's from party internal struggle. Internal struggle. So one thing you said is definitely right. Now, Communist Party, when they do those investigations, they not 100% release the truth. They release the truth you know, in a limited, it's a control way. How to control that? First is those are secret documents, only used for party inside the struggle. The general people, they don't know. In America, we just published after how many years? Those documents were generated in 1987. We got published them in 2016, last year. Still, ordinary Chinese people in China, they can see those documents. But one thing to be sure, they always, they never you know, exaggerate the numbers. They always try to control the numbers. That's why the non-government investigation and the government investigation have difference. Always non-government in, uh, investigation, the number is high, the government is low. Yeah, but very good question. Very good question. Please. It's been 40 years since that incident mm -hmm. that we were talking about, but do you believe, since you're saying that it's still not over, that the mm -hmm. Communist Party is still alive, if it was to take over again, would, we, would they do social order like they did previously, or would it be different today? Okay. Uh, basically, you know, uh, Xi and the Mao, I think it's different. The, yes, one thing is uh, in common. The current leader want to establish himself the position like a Mao, position like a Mao. But the Mao is a great dictator. No, he just used part of mass against the part of, you know, Communist Party members, bureaucrats. Then he used army to against, no, he lacked everything in control because he is the founder of the army, founder of this country. But she certainly is not that much in power, that much, because she is a young generation. So what she wants to, it's just people, you know, listen to him, follow, follow him. Now, you, we don't need to use you, only use some part of, you know, uh, the state enterprise, please, or party, you know, some party committee to, against the other party rivals. But he dared to launch the mass movement across China in 10 years. Now, current leader have different from uh, Chairman Mao. Any question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll also, um, in relation to the question about mm. classification and how much um, are these documents where, could you explain a little bit about um, the classification levels okay. of documents? Because I know there's, there's naval fashion. Yeah. Like yeah. Internal yeah. search. Yeah, right. yeah. But I can get those mm. in the archives sometimes yeah. mm. um, if I talk to the right people. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. It's not super classified. Yeah. But how, how classified are these documents, and can you tell us a little bit okay. about the, the uh, Generally, there is a three level of classification. One classification is a secret. Yeah. The second classification is uh, we not a general secret. It's a, we could say middle secret. We call it jimi, jimi. The first one we call mimi. It's a general secret. And the Last one, the last one is extremely secret, extremely secret. So basically, this kind of document is the middle, it's the middle. But this kind of document I published last year, it's only have, the whole China only have 300 copies. Why we could luckily get those copies is based upon the party inside the power struggle. Because one part of the opposition officers, 
to the general way, the general way. They lack very much to expose general way as a killer. So as soon as they get those documents, sometimes it's their sons, their daughters, they come to the United States, they study in Harvard, they in Washington, D.C., they donate those documents to us. Because they knew if they stay in China, they cannot publish forever. They want to get published. So sometimes it's a, they contact me, contact me. They say, oh, Professor Song, I have certain documents I could give you free. The only one thing is we lack, you know, the whole overseas peoples know the historical truth. So you could see a lot of activities. The motivation is inside the party's power struggle or inside the party's conflicts. But for scholars, because we pursue the truth, so what? Whatever you give us, we accept. We combine, we publish. So that's the reason. That's the reason. See that? Yeah. Lee, and I'm sure you shared this with me before, but um, you know, it's been several years. But please remind me, um, you mentioned that at one point you were part of the Cultural Revolution. Yeah. And you were a young mm. man, and you get carried away with the moment, and just like young folks do nowadays, I suppose. Yeah. And then, and then at some point in time, you reflected, right? Yeah. And you decided you were going to become a scholar and then yeah. expose the truth. Yeah. Putting yourself in danger because you were thrown <laughs> in jail true. and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so, so at what point and okay. what happened that made you reflect and change your, your oh, okay. view? Oh, OK. OK. Uh, you know, I always say study the cultural revolution, study the communist China is my fate, is my destiny. Why? Because, uh, because I studied cultural revolution, I was two times in jail. When it's uh, in, during the cultural revolution, that's from 1971 to 1976. If Mao would not die, I would have died in prison, <laughs> die in prison. So why? Because uh, I always say all generations journey, the journey is from Mao's support to his enemy. The beginning of the Cultural Revolution, we really support Mao because the young person, young students, we also have you know, so many imaginations. We think Mao may be right. We support him, we could go to heaven. Actually, we go to hell, right? So in 1968, we saw the revolution go to the dead end. So then we organized underground reading group. We read a lot of, at the time, I cannot read English, only read the translation of English, those books. For instance, one book influenced me at that time. It's called The Raise and the Four, the Third Life by the American very famous uh, journalist, the Shahis. You know, it's a talk about the Nazi Germany. So when I read that, I compare with the current China, the, the, the time, the Cultural Revolution, I find that it's totally the same, totally the same. So this cost me five years in jail because a small group, we read that the time, you read the Western book and uh, you say bad words to Mao, bad words towards to the revolution, they could even put a death sentence on you. I fortunately was not you know, killed by them, but I stayed in the jail for five years. After Mao's death, then Deng Xiaoping gathered the power, cultural revolution was announced as a mistake. Then we, I have a chance to go to college. The time I went to college is already 30 years old, <laughs> 30 years old. So then I went to here and uh, uh, I, to do the graduate studies, I think I should you know, uh, study on the cultural revolution because I already spent one five years jail time for it. 
I did not expect. In 1999, I flew back to China to collect material. I was arrested by Chinese AGB again, <laughs> you know, right? Yeah, half year, half year. If you read the uh, newspaper, uh, certainly, you know, in 1999 to 2000, I was stay in China's KGB's jail for half year because the international media, international scar committee, even, you know, the, uh, uh, the Congress as well, State Department, even White House, they send, you know, people go Beijing to negotiate. Why? Because at the time, there is no conflict between the United States and China. So one small laboring became a focus, a focus. 200 newspapers, CNN, you know, all report that incident. <laughs> so make my research nowadays more convenient. Why? Because you apply for grant, you send them, I'm so in so, you attach a New York Times report on your, so people believe it. People go, yeah, I, I give you money, <laughs> give me money. So it's a very interesting thing. So for me, I think we go through the bloody experience, then we finally awaken, awaken, then, as I say, the old generation, the journey is from Mao's support to his enemy. So it's different from current, you know, uh, because uh, I noticed that your campus, uh, a lot of students, young students are from China, right? They could easily come to here to, to study. Also, they could uh, read those English books. In my days, only one book you could read is the Chairman Mao's book, just like North Korea. North Korea. You could read its uh, Jing Zheng Un's book, Jing Zheng Un's father's book, Jing Zheng Un's grandfather's book. You cannot uh, go to the internet. So as I say, the fortunately, the American military killed Mao Edison. So <laughs> make China not become a, uh, because Mao want to give his son's, uh, you know, the position. There is no son. He could give the position. <laughs> yeah, please. So in my opinion, I think, do you think, uh, my first question, do you think maybe during the Cultural Revolution, we should, mm -hmm. also, ex we should also consider maybe the, 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 the most, the, also the kind of the historical background of mm -hmm. the period? Because um, I don't think today, in the current situation, mm -hmm. the China will, will, have, will happen the Cultural Revolution again. Mm -hmm. because, because I think the most important thing is the, the, the the population's education level has been, has mm. been raised up. Mm. Most of the young generation like us, we have at least get the, get the, like the, the high school mm. level education. Mm. So, but during the 1960s, when the Cultural Revolution happened, mm. um, even though we can we can know that uh, like thousands or hundreds of intellectuals mm. have been persecuted during that period, mm. but even that, uh, comparing the whole population amount, is they, they are still a very very little percentage of the mm. population during that time. Mm. So, and then you know, in the 1950s, they are still have like many, many terrible social movements before happened. Mm. So for the, for the like lots of uh, unlettered or without any education people during that mm. time mm. in the in the countryside or in the cities, what they could do when the another great social movement happened, what they would do was just to there's some kind of, like you said, the, mm. the, the, like the, some kind of the evil spirit in the, yeah. the body side they have just to inspire. Yeah. So that's the, that's the reason why the, also like the Guangxi province, it's a very, you know, it's a the bod bodinary, close to the Vietnam mm. bodinary, it's, it's mm. very, uh, some kind of like, like the, the Chinese saying, the, mm. the emperor is, is, is far mm. away and, the, mm. and the no one, the, the, mm. the some kind of, no one, no the central government will know what happened mm. in, in, the, in, the, mm. in the far away place. Mm. So, so in my opinion, I, um, so do you think that maybe it's also she should be considering like some kind of, in the cultural region, the beginning, uh, of course, definitely mm. the, the, like the, the Chairman Mao, she wants to start his 
like to establish his like his his absolutely uh, absolute authority, power. Authority. Yeah. Authority. Yeah. But oh, in, but yeah. after that, mm. some kind of it's off, kind of out of control, like in the Guangxi province, mm. and the, also the the central government, they they unwilling or they not have ability to control the 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 the, the, the far away mm. place. Mm. That's my mm. first question. And the mm. other question is, uh, you, you, your conclusion is that the revolution is not finished. Mm. So, so w how do you think? How do you think how the revolution could be finished? Okay. Or, or other, in other words, if if in in the some a kind of dreaming world, do you think mm. what will be the best way to finish the revolution? Okay. Okay. Yeah, very good question. Okay, it's also a typical questions that the young people have. When Question. I sort of partially agree with you those chaos related to people's education. But I partially disagree with you those definitely related to the education. You know, there is a Red Terror August in 1966. In Beijing, only one month, how many people were killed? This is the government. Uh, 1,772 people were killed. Who were killed? January is a school teacher, university professors, those intellectual figures. Who is a killer? Students, high school students, college students. So just like you acknowledge, at the time when China went through the Cultural Revolution, if you could get a high you know, school education, you could get a college education, it's only very few people, very few people. See, they become a killer, become a killer. So that's why I say I partially agree with you, another partially I disagree with you. Yes, there is a relationship, but it's not a definite relationship. Still, the system play very important role. The system, it's a hood system. It's a ruler's system. It's the high-ranking leader's system. So if China still inside this class struggle theory, class struggle theory, so this theory, even though there is no class enemy, they need to create a class enemy. For instance, right now, right now, you know, if you look at the State Department's uh, human rights uh, report in China, when Xi Jinping got in power three years, compared with his uh, previous success, uh, previous leader, compared with Jiang Zemin, compared with Hu Jintao, he is the leader, you know, arrested most, arrested most the human rights lawyers, right? They fighting for people's human rights, the human rights activists, and as well as those who have opposition, you know, opposite views, the intellectuals. So when I say the revolution is not finished, I'm not a say, is to say the cultural revolution will very simply repeat in China. This is impossible because history cannot simply copy, simply copy. What I say is the system. For instance, for Xi Jinping, it's not even pursue the democracy inside the party. He is pursuing China go back to Mao's track, to Mao's track. Of course, he has so many limitations, right? Because China is not 50 years ago. China, one thing is to be sure, China linked to the whole world economy. This is a very powerful thing. But if you look at Xi Jinping's uh, you know, speech, Xi Jinping is the only leader compared with Jiang Zemin, compared with Hu Jintao. You know, if you read 2013, his speech for Mao's birthday, you know, every year you know, when Mao's birthday, Communist leaders, they will give speech. But Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, before Xi Jinping, the two leaders, just very general, because they do need this kind of process. But if you read it, 
2013 you to read the Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping in eight times use Mao's point. And Xi Jinping promote something like a class struggle. You know, so every leader is different. Leaders different. Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, I talk about two private communist leaders before Xi. They did not pursue one person's dictatorship and they basically they maintain the group of people's dictator. That means the political bureau, the Zheng Ju Lindao, Zheng Ju Lindao. But she is totally different. No, you China, if you talk about she, you know, she Zhu Xi, you you talk about she, it's above the political bureau. This is very dangerous, very dangerous. I'm not saying, say, cultural revolution will be, you know, happen to, to be in, in China tomorrow, or, but this is a dangerous trip, dangerous trip for, for Xi. It's not good for China because China already merged the economy in the world global system. How to prevent this kind of revolution happen again? I think one thing is we should acknowledge the you know, the general value, that means freedom, equity, democracy. We China should to do the political reform. Economically, China did very successful. Politically, China reform is far more from enough, far more from enough. So every intellectual should worry about that, should worry about that. Because China is a bigger country, is the number second economic power. If go to this way, go this way, it's not a good way for China. So that's my answer. Yeah, please. Steve. May I make a couple of comments? Sure. Um, sure. The, the first one, the first comment that I want to make is the left. Yeah. I like to talk to people with my back to you. Um, the first comment that, I'm, that I would like to, to, sh to uh, share with you is regarding China and, and how we uh, perceive China from a distance. And we've, uh, some of us have been observing China for quite a while in Chinese politics. <clears throat> Supposedly, China has a, um, a classless society. At least that's what Chinese leaders uh, claim. But many of us are aware that China has lots of contradictions, just like our country. <laughs> um, I, I'm, we're aware that the Chinese uh, uh, society has, has a, a, a layer of people who are very privileged. Uh, for example, the, the people on the top of the, top of the party, their sons and daughters tend to have a lot of privilege. Um, recently, I don't remember how many years ago, but recently Chinese, the Chinese government opened up and, and allowed certain people to become very rich. You, you hear of all these very extremely it's rich, excuse me, extremely, extremely rich people. Yeah. Richer than some of our own rich folks. <laughs> so, so there's all these contradictions. Um, that's one comment that I would like to make, you know, just food for thought. Um, uh, the, 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 there's another comment that, oh, oh yeah, the other comment that I would like to, to, to make is, uh, has to do with two books that I found very interesting in relation to your presentation. By the way, this is an excellent presentation. Thank you very Thank much, you. Professor yeah. uh, Zong. Um, there's two books. Well, you mentioned uh, The Rise and Fall of the yeah. Third Reich, yeah. a, a very important book, historical book that, that, that a lot of us have read. At some point, you should all read it. The failed line of thought in terms of world power by the Nazis and, and that kind of of, of um, uh, government. Uh, and the reason I mentioned it, and, and I'm glad you mentioned it, because there seems to be a rise of people of that kind of thought in the world, and even in our own country. So you guys should read that, because there's people expounding that line of thought again. They want to be Nazis, and they want to push Nazism on us. Very dangerous. Then, let me suggest that you read a, a couple of other books. One of them is my, The Librarian in Me, in me Comes Out. Excuse me. 
um, there's another book entitled uh, The Rise and Fall of the Superpowers. I have that at home. <coughs> I've, read it, I've read portions of it. I won't say I've read all of it, but I've read, read portions of it, especially the, the last few chapters has to do with the, with the rise and power of the US and, and the Western powers. Read it carefully, because it talks about the rise and, and fall of the US as a, as a world power. A lot of what's happening currently has been predicted years ago by these guys that have been observing and, and studying. Interesting. How did they know that the US, US power is going to be challenged? How did they know? The third book that I'm going to suggest you read in the know. I'll, go, I'll sit down because I can go on for hours too, uh, but I won't. Um, it's it's a, a, a little book entitled The Next 100 Years. And I forget the, the, the author's name, but I remember the title very carefully. I, I read it from, from the beginning to the end. The last chapter talks about China challenging the U.S. in terms of world the, uh, power politically and economically. How did he know? By the way, the author uh, was a classmate of mine at, at UT Austin. Um, so you, I studied at UT Austin. But anyway, the, uh, and then there's another, in that last chapter, he also predicts that Mexico and, and other countries in the South are going to start challenging the US as far as economics and, and, and production and all that. I don't know if that's, that'll come to be, but you know, as, as the next generation of leaders, you all should read these books because they have a lot to, to offer in terms of history and, 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 and how, to prepare, how we need to prepare ourselves to meet the, meet the challenges of, of the future. I didn't, want, I didn't mean to go too oh, long. Very good, very good, very good, good extension, very good extension. You really made me think about it, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, providing your presentation. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for allowing me to, cut, yeah. to share. Any question we could uh, still have time to discuss? Yeah. All, all questions are very good. Or, yeah, uh, your question and uh, other person's questions are very good. Yeah. So, yeah uh, again? My yeah. question. Sure. Uh, yeah, do you think it, that's possible? Because mm. for our generation right mm. now, I think many of our Chinese people, I also come from Shanghai. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, I find a one, yeah, uh, Lao Xiang Zeli, yeah. <laughs> Shanghainese, yeah. yeah. For our generation, we have some kind of, I think it's, a, although I know it's a, some kind of like uh, different idea among our generation, but mm. some, there are still, uh, there are still very strong voice that considering that, uh, even though the, our, the, the political system in our country right mm. now is some kind of very authoritarian, Mm. It's because only one party policy, uh, yeah. only one party to control all the yeah, nation. Right. But because all the economy is very successful mm. since from uh, since the since the after Deng Xiaoping's reform, mm. reform, uh, reform, uh, reform and open the door. Mm. Uh, right now we have we have already become the second largest economy power in the mm. world, mm. and uh, uh, some 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 economic also consider maybe the maybe China mm. just keep the the growth mm. right now the the keep the growth speed right now, we could be some kind of equal to be like America in, in before like, like uh, 2040 or 2000. Oh, very possible. Yeah. That's possible. Ah. But many, peop many people, many Chinese people also considering that uh, it's, that's okay as long as the, the mm. economy grows and the people's, the people's uh, li living standards is keep growing and growing. Mm. So, use, and uh, also I want to, and also very, interesting example is that there is a, some kind of mirror to the mm. to the China to the China mainland mm. is Taiwan. Mm. So Taiwan also become had during the Chiang Kai Shek um, mm. and of uh, his, his son's period is also mm. a very uh, also the thing like the one party mm. uh, one party system. But mm. after that the Taiwan has start its start its own democratic yeah. uh, process. Mm. But but in the same time when after that, uh, we we saw a, a some kind of embarrassing thing is that the Taiwan the mm. Taiwan economy stopped growing. Mm. So that's kind of so you know for for my own experience, mm. like ten years ago, Taiwan is some kind of the reelected the the, the 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 some kind of the, the the model of the some kind of the 
the Let's say five models of the, the, no, no, the, the, the small the, dragon, right? No, five the, 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 like it's, huh? it's like 10 years ago, I think mm. many, many Chinese people in the mainland think mm. Taiwan is some kind of a step forward than mm. our mainland. But mm. right now, many people in, for our generation, we're mm. just considering, oh, maybe if we like, we like Taiwan to be stuck our our like Moscow mm. party system, it's mm. more, it's, it might be because in the Taiwan situation right now, it's the Moscow party system costs mm. a very, some kind of, I, I believe it's some kind of economic weight because the mm. two parties, they just want to be, get the, the vote, but the, they did not to respond for the economic growth. Some kind of, so mm. the Taiwan economy has been mm. stopped for like, like, like just kind of stopped for like de decades. So mm. that's the voice, that's some kind of voice for mm. our generation that, that concern maybe. So mm. that's okay if the, the, the political system did not change or mm. slowly change, but mm. as long as the, the, the as long as the economic growth is keep going. Ah. So do you think is that possible? Is that possible that mm. um, this situation will keep will keep will keep going? Some kind of the political system is slowly change, but the mm. economic growth keep going. Okay, uh, let me. If this is uh, I also you know did not study but I consider a lot uh, like a sheer wisdom. Okay, first of all, you know you compare Taiwan and uh, uh, China. You know, there is a couple of things you cannot compare because China is a very big country, big market, and a big manpower. Taiwan is uh, how many people there? The population is about 30 million, under 30 million. But if you want to compare, I think uh, one thing really could compare is uh, average income. You know, if you compare with China, how many billion people there? I think 13 to 15 billion, maybe, yeah, people there. I, if you compare with Taiwan, only 30 million, Taiwan's uh, average person's income, I think it's uh, about 50 times as mainland China, as mainland China. Could be, could be. I, maybe I calculated it's wrong. So if you talk about, yes, a lot of Chinese people share the same thoughts of you, say, okay, you know, the political reform we want, but the leaders don't want to do that, but as long as the, you know, uh, the economics, uh, it's uh, growing, uh, still okay. But I think as uh, intellectuals, uh, we should put us a high standard. You know, there is a, uh, during the Guangxi massacre, you know, those uh, militias, those, uh, you know, uh, army officers, they killed those Black Five family members. They said, we are not a kill those uh, person. It's a kill animal, kill pig, because they demoralize those class enemies. So we are intellectuals, we are young generations with high education, we certainly want to pursue the, you know, the universal value, something like human rights, freedom of speech, all those. So we cannot say, okay, if you could fit us, we don't need other things, then we will be put our standards low. This is one thing. Second thing, you know, compare with the past 30 years, yes, you know, current uh, China's uh, uh, rate, you know, the uh, G GOP, uh, GDP rate is 6.9. I read the Chinese uh, statistics, you know, uh, could be, you could believe, you could not believe because one party, they could cook up those uh, you know, statistics. But anyway, Think about three years ago, think about five years ago, China's growth is 15%, 15%. You could see, you could see the down, you could see the down. Yes, still growth, but you could see the down. Also, you could see the results of China get a high speed 30 years. It's satisfy, you know, the low standard of human rights. You know, the low standard of environment. If you, the Shanghai is okay, right? If you went to Beijing, at least three months, three to six months, 
there will be a toxic fox in Beijing. You know, people even go the, on the walk, cannot see you. See that you here, I cannot see you. Why? Because they satisfy, satisfy, you know, the environment. They don't protect the environment. Only the pursuit is the GDP. Only the pursuit is GDP. Pollution. Yeah, pollution. pollution. Just like uh, 70 years ago, Los Angeles. So if there is a you know, better political structure where taking care of this kind of things, China's pollution as well as the environment toxin, toxin. You know, according to the United Nations, about 70% Chinese lander is, you know, the po poison is poisoned. Those kind of things, maybe we can, we only see the beginning, we only see the beginning of Beijing, of Shanghai, the pollution. After 20 years, if we don't care about this, then we will see the results. Then if we, the results is, if we exchange by our human rights, by environment, by those kind of things, how about our generation, next generation to us, our sons, our grandsons? So that's why we think even though for keep living healthily, we need a political system reform. So that's my concern. Yes, as a Shanghainese, I'm not sure you know a saying in Shanghainese, in all generation, say that, Shanghai need to develop faster. We don't need anything but one empty good policy. That means Shanghai needs is naturally want to develop, want to get rich. They full energy want to get, want to work hard, but they don't have the Communist Party give them a good policy. If you look at 30 years of China's economic reform, Communist Party give people what? Only give people one thing, policy, right? They give people a right policy than the Chinese people, think because the Chinese people really work hard. If you go to downtown, you see China downtown's grocery store Chinese you know, uh, the restaurants will close average 9 to 10 o'clock, right? the kind of o'clock. But American, you know, restaurants usually is 8 o'clock, or grocery stores usually is 8 o'clock or something. Christmas, you know, all Chinese restaurants, all Chinese, uh, you know, uh, grocery stores open. <laughs> all American grocery stores are closed. So if you go back, if Communist Party, they could only give right the policy China could develop that fast. Also, the wrong policy still, you know, surprised the Chinese energy go to the right direction. So we really sh should not satisfy with the current achievement. Actually, the 30 years, the reform, if a political reform is the same, China could go much faster. Talk about Taiwan. I visited Taiwan a couple of times. Also, I visited Taiwan. I saw in their Congress, they fighting each other, fighting each other. But think about that, think about that. You know, in Communist Party, their Central Party's meetings, they not fighting each other. They only say, support the Chairman Mao, support the Xi. What happened? is how many people were died. You know, during the so-called Great Leap Forward and the Great Famine, it's about 30 million people died. Even though those congressmen fighting each other, but how many people died outside their house? No, no. You know, any society, any, I'm not an economist, but if you study any society, they go to a certain period, 
will need a lot of you know adjustment, like Japan, like Taiwan. But Taiwan's you know GDP growth is still two more percent, still two more percent. It's not a stop, not a stop. It's a, actually I think the political leaders they you know inv involved or or interrupted to the economic activities. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think just like uh, as I said, you are Shanghai such a Shanghai saying say Shanghai need nothing, only one good policy. <laughs> we could have built our hometown very beautifully. <laughs> so that's uh, you know a little bit uh, aside my field, but uh, it's uh, my thoughts share with you. And may I have a, uh, the last question? Oh sure, sure. Okay. One thing, uh, one point that I'm very um, agree with him. I also um, don't think revolution will happen again in China. Mm. In China, I know uh, you already explained uh, this point, but mm. what I mean um, is different mm. because you mentioned uh, the Xi. You mentioned lots of times that about the Mao thought, mm. and you think uh, this is very dangerous to the modern China, but I don't think so. Because the reason why Chairman Xi repeated multiple times about the Mao South, mm. because some of the Mao South, they are also mm. constructive policies for modern China, which means Mao South, mm. they can have a positive impact mm. for the modern China. And I also think uh, you already mm. haven't been living in China mm. for many years. Mm. So you don't know what China look like um, in today. China changes a lot mm. compared to the past. Mm. And uh, also many foreign media, mm. I mean, mm. when they reported the news about mm. China and also the Chinese culture, they all reported negative. Even some the news about China, they are not true. They are like mm. fake news. Mm. I know, I try the CNN. Mm. Some of the news that CNN reported uh, about China are just mm. fake news. Okay, uh, on one part, I agree with you. We all agree, say, the history will not simply repeat himself, right? The Cultural Revolution. It's uh, uh, like you know the Guangxi province uh, totally copy and repeat. It's impossible. On another hand, uh, I'm not dis uh, agree with you. You say the Mao's thoughts have so many uh, constructive ways for the Chinas. Actually, if we talk about economically, Mao's thoughts is a disaster. You know the Da Yue Jing. But you know the Da Zhe, you know the Xue Da Qing, all those kind of things. Uh, today we look back, it's really the, it's a joke. It's a joke. Mao is the person know how to fight him. Militarily, he may be a great craft, but economically, he is certainly not good. I think economically, Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin. It's much better than him, much better than him. When we, I talk about Xi Jinping, uh, you know, praise Mao, what I focus, as I said, is what kind of structure, the leadership structure Xi Jinping want to establish. You know, if you go to China cannot choose or copy American system tomorrow, Will be, disaster, will be disaster. But one thing, people always say one thing. You know, if you want to democracy, like a former leader Wen Jiabao and the former leader Hu Jintao, they are also leader of the Communist Party. They acknowledge the universal value of freedom, of you know, human rights, of democracy. It's on their speech. Xi Jinping never you know, do that. What I talk about is the leadership structure. You know, people always say, if you want to try the democracy system, you could from your party, from your party. 
also after the Cultural Revolution, Deng Xiaoping did one good thing. It's Deng Xiaoping issued a resolution in 1981. That means China from the Cultural Revolution, we will follow collective leadership, GTI Lindao, collective. There is no one could above the collective leadership. But now Xi Jinping's activities is backwards. It's backwards. Actually, it's against, it's opposite to Deng Xiaoping and the Communist Party. In 1981, they established the resolution. resolution. So, as I said, partly I agree with you, partly I uh, disagree with you. So you talk about uh, fake news uh, or, or something. You know, I have a lot of uh, connections uh, with China. So many students, professors. Uh, I don't read. Usually, I don't read the CNN. Usually, I don't read the New York Times. I read those news from gross level. Gross level. I still have my family in China. I have relatives in China. Of course, I know how economically, you know, developed. But as I said, this is not belong to the Communist Party. It's the Chinese people. Communist Party give people what kind of thing? One policy. It's an empty policy. It's enough for Shanghainese. <laughs> Thank you for a good question. <laughs>